Today's speaker is Lynn Harvey. She is a research scientist at LASP and the Atmospheric and Oceanic Science Department at CU. And she received her bachelor's and PhD from the Atmosphere and Oceanic Sciences Department at University of Wisconsin-Madison. And then she spent six years uh, working at NASA Langley Research Center and then came to LASP in 2003, where she has been since. And her interest is the dynamics and transport in the middle atmosphere with a focus on the winter polar vortex and planetary wave breaking. And her research also seeks to understand how the sudden stratospheric warming events influence the upward and downward vertical coupling in atmosphere. And today she will talk about the polar vortices in the MLT of Wacom. So, go ahead. Thanks, Nick. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'd like for this to kind of be informal and for you to ask me questions, interrupt, have it be a dialogue. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the, the polar vortices in Wacom. Uh, what Nick didn't tell you was that my research over the years has elevated in altitude. My expertise is in the stratosphere, uh, more lower, lower stratosphere, UTLS. And uh, from grad school to my work out at Langley, I've continued to rise across the stratopause and into the mesosphere where things are a lot different, where I need to consider diurnal effects and electrodynamics. Um, now I'm going to talk about uh, circulations in the, in the mesosphere, lower thermosphere, of which I know very little. So I'm open to your ideas, your suggestions. Um, no hard questions, because I won't be able to answer them. <laughs> but um, let's just have a good time. So I need to uh, acknowledge that a bunch of people that I've been working with for advice, some um, ionospheric people, Larissa Goncharenko, Val Valeri Yudin, Astrid, and, um, and others who I've bounced some of my results off of to get some insight. And like I said, feel free to offer me up your ideas. So I, I have this opening shot of the aurora because 110 kilometers is just about as high as I'm going to go. In terms of an outline, uh, I figured I'd have fun. Um, you really get back to basics. I didn't know what uh, people did here in terms of their expertise, solar, magnetosphere. And so I'm going to get right back to you know the planets rotating. We've got Coriolis force, um, ideal gas law, that kind of thing. But I won't stay there too long. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the public perception of the polar vortex. It's really fun um, to be able to go out into the public and say, you know what the polar vortex is, and have them say yes. And, um, but they don't know what it is. They have no idea that it's um, misconceptions and misinformation that has been spread through the news. Um, so while it's really neat to have my work uh, understood by the public, you know, for so long it was so, so far removed and abstract, and now the public actually knows what the polar vortex is, but they don't know what the polar vortex is. So I'm going to talk about some of those scare tactics and, and um, news stories in, in the weather reports. And then I'm going to launch into what's the polar vortex doing right this second and show you what the current conditions are. And all of that's going to lead to a motivation of why we care. So I'll briefly cover a few areas of research that are ongoing at LASP and, and throughout the world uh, related to the polar vortex before I go into what does the polar vortex look like in Wacom. I'll show a 2009 case study first to demonstrate 3D structures and evolution and then end with uh, climatology, where I average many, many years together and show you average conditions. So meteorology 101, right? We've got a vertical profile of temperature through the atmosphere. And uh, I gave a, a last public lecture last year where I just wanted people to be familiar with the terminology troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere. I'm sure you are all familiar, so I won't dwell on that here. But I do want to take this opportunity to emphasize that the polar vortex lives in the vertical domain ranging from the tropopause to about the mesopause. So when you see a picture like this in the weather report, it's, uh, it appears as though you've got some kind of cable surrounding a blue patch that's sitting on the ground, and it's not. This is very far away from the Earth's surface. And I really wanted to emphasize that we're way above the clouds. You all know that, probably, with your research at HAO and, and over at NCAR, that we're, we're at high altitudes uh, above where the planes fly. So why is the vortex there? I mean, is this just completely redundant and mundane? Should I skip this slide? Or, or could you all tell me in gory detail why the polar vortex is there? 
Okay. <laughs> okay, excellent. So, um, you know, we're on a rotating planet, and we've got uh, the, the atmosphere follows the, ide the ideal gas law and sort of Newtonian physics. So if you've got a cold column of air um, that represents sort of wi winter conditions at high latitudes, and um, a warm column of air that represents uh, sort of the vertical column at low latitudes over the equator, the pressure decreases with altitude and it d does so faster over the cold air because it's denser. So if you slice across these columns, if you consider you've got an equal number of molecules in each column, you slice across at a certain altitude, you're gonna reach lower pressure aloft above the cold air compared to the warm air because all of your mass is squished in below, it's denser. So what happens is the atmosphere doesn't like uh, low pressure, it doesn't like a vacuum, so it wants to fill that in. And since the planet is rotating, the Coriolis deflects the flow to the right. And so around a low pressure system, you have uh, counterclockwise flow. And uh, around a high pressure, pressure system, you have uh, flow in the opposite direction. And everything is reversed in the southern hemisphere. So if you get that principle, then you can just apply it to the atmosphere and some of the weather maps that I'm going to show you, and that pretty much explains why you have a polar vortex or circumpolar jet stream in the wintertime. But that's not what they tell people uh, in the news on the weather report. What they're trying to do, the meteorologists and maybe more the producers of the, of the newscast, want to instill some fear and, and kind of get hypey and dramatic to get people to watch the show. At least that's my um, impression, is that we want to be dramatic and use these um, sort of uh, words that promote uh, emotions and, and get people involved. So the word vortex is frightening, all back from schematics of <laughs> ships getting sucked into the ocean to Twister, uh, Wizard of Oz, Dorothy, Twister, cows flying. Sharknado is the latest uh, offender. Um, the word vortex, so polar vortex uh, inspires fear. Of course, the black hole being at last, I wanted to represent some uh, space physics there. So just the word vortex uh, it conjures fear in us. And we're gonna turn away from um, making dinner and watch the, the weather report when they're talking about the polar vortex. I did a Google search on scary polar vortex and these are the images that came up. Um, you know, it's just nothing related to any kind of information content. We've got a little whirlwind of polar bear heads. It's only there to scare us and, and nothing more. And it does. You know, we watch like crazy. We talk about it at the water cooler and complain about the polar vortex and how cold it is. And we bond about the negativity. And, um, you know, all this time since the word went viral, um, you know, myself and my colleagues are like, oh my God, I can't believe all the attention that it's getting. And like, they're actually talking about what I'm working about and, um, and, and then sort of not knowing what to do about it, how to get the real message out of what the polar vortex is. You know, at this point, we know that we don't know what the vortex is. I ask people on the streets what the vortex is and they have no idea. You know, Mr. Do Dosecchi's admits it, Colbert in his parka says, well, at least it sounds science-y. <laughs> So we've got this quadrant of knowledge that I'm so fond of. And you know, we're born here, and we, we don't know anything, and we don't even know that we don't know anything. And we grow up, and we learn things, and we know that we don't know everything. There are known unknowns. And that's kind of where we are with the vortex. And what my goal is in this whole talk is to move us from this quadrant over here, known knowns. So to not know what the vortex is, to know what the vortex is. But this is what we see in the news reports. We get uh, very colorful, vibrant uh, images of the weather with cables and jet streams and arrows and, and flashy words like bizarre and Mars, insane and extreme. Beast of a hurricane is my personal favorite. <laughs> um, and they're not, they're not consistent. They're conflicting. You know, where is the vortex in any one of these uh, pictures that represent the same meteorological event? Um, this one says the vortex is down over, you know, the Midwest, and I, ABC kind of gets it the, the most accurately with, you know, we've got the Arctic air, cold air outbreak, and then the vortex is sitting up here over the pole. 
but it's no wonder people are confused. You know, I mean, it, it is gripping, it is, it is sensational, but it's not very informative. So we're just gonna get a little bit boring and go to today's uh, weather conditions. So I'm gonna, next series of maps are gonna be with this orientation, polar stereographic with the pole in the middle and uh, the US at six o'clock, Africa to the right and the Pacific on the left. And you can go to this website at NOAA to get these maps and for current current conditions and forecasts out 10, 15 days to see what, if you're ever interested, what the uh, flow field and the stratosphere looks like. And so here we've got um, contours that depict the height of a pressure surface in the lower stratosphere. And so this is kind of that cutting across those columns that I showed earlier where the low it's the, this pressure surface is at low altitudes and that's because there's cold air below that's uh, dense versus at um, the low latitudes surrounding the hemisphere. You've got that warm column of air in the, in the, in the tropics that is expanded and at high altitudes. And so I think of this as you know, topo lines on a map. You'd wanna sort of hike down into the valley and you get to your, your low, it's always uh, showing you where the coldest air is below. And so this was uh, forecast on Monday for today, and it shows that you've got you know, east or west to east flow, okay? So you've got flow that wants to fill in the, the low, and then the Coriolis turns to the right, and so you've got west to east flow around the hemisphere, and that's all because it's winter, it's not getting sun, and so it's cold, and then you get the cold pool over the pole, and you get waves around in mid-latitudes. So most notably over the west coast of the US right now, we've got a ridge, and they probably have really nice sunny skies, and um, it's not too bad here in Colorado either. So that's the current meteorological situation in the lower stratosphere. This is what people refer to as the polar vortex. Um, you know, this is much more boring than the images that I showed you before with the polar, polar bear heads swirling. You know, I'm not sure that people would maybe want to watch this. And so for good reason, you really need to love your job and, and be interested in the weather to deal with, you know, this official definition of the polar vortex is the planetary scale, cyclonic circulation, uh, just means counterclockwise flow around uh, the low pressure system centered on the pole. This is from the AMS and it, they say it extends from the troposphere to the stratosphere. And I'm gonna work to uh, update this definition because from my work, the vortex extends up into the mesosphere. So we should go troposphere through the stratosphere and up into the mesosphere. So what I'm gonna do now is then show you some maps at higher altitudes. When I was a grad student, I always wanted to know what was going on at higher altitudes um, above the top of our data sets. So here's the same um, map that I just showed. And what we're gonna do is track those ridges and see whether or not they grow or die out with height. So here, this is at about 17 kilometers in the lower stratosphere. If we go up a few kilometers, the, a lot of the waves get filtered out, they break, they um, get absorbed into the flow and everything is a lot more laminar and smooth. It's just a, uh, a lot less wiggles around the low pressure system now, but that, that ridge persists over the west coast of the US. And at even higher altitudes, this is now in the middle stratosphere, that uh, ridge has now turned into, uh, while very weak, this is extremely puny for the Aleutian anticyclone, but uh, uh, we do have a closed contour indicating anticyclonic flow around that uh, high pressure system that is a climatological feature. It's often sitting over the Aleutian Islands, so it's got its name based on its location. And this is a fairly undisturbed um, situation for this time of year. Um, a lot of times the vortex could be completely split in half, or you could, you could have uh, large planetary waves breaking. Right now, it's just a little bit offset from the pole, and otherwise pretty circular and uh, nondescript. So that's what's going on right now with the flow around the low in one direction, the flow around the high in another. If you go up, this is the highest altitude that is offered at this site. This is at stratopause altitudes, and now that anticyclone is gone, uh, it too has uh, 
been absorbed or, or the wave has broken or whatever, the, the low pressure system dominates the hemispheric circulation. And other than being a little bit displaced and a little bit oblong, it is really undisturbed. It's a very quiet situation going on in the middle atmosphere today. This is another site that you can go to for current conditions, uh, Earth Null School. It's pretty spiffy. The um, arrows denote the wind and the colors denote the speed. So the pink shows really high winds around the polar vortex. And this is at about 35 kilometers. It's valid today. You can select different altitudes, different um, variables, and look all the way from the surface up to the middle stratosphere at uh, temperature, winds, water vapor, and different map projections. You can you know, distort the globe and all this. So have fun with it. Go to these sites and stay tuned. If anyone you know, says, is the polar vortex overhead? You can go and you can answer intelligently. Um, you know, today, I, uh, I would suspect that the vortex wouldn't be overhead because it's a beautiful day, but it's just, it doesn't, it's not that simple. So um, last year when I gave this talk, or a talk similar to it, it was super cold and everyone thought, well, is the vortex overhead? And it looked exactly like it does today. So while the vortex does interact and influence surface weather, it's not on a case by case basis where you can actually trace down event to event and say, this is why. So we, it's still an ongoing area of research. So this movie is intended, I've only shown you static um, plot so far, and I want to emphasize that the vortex is a dynamic feature. It moves around on a day-to-day -day basis. As you go higher on an hour-to-hour -hour basis, the jet stream it, on the edge wobbles and distorts and stretches and pulls, and it's all based on what's going on below. You've got cold fronts and warm fronts moving around, and uh, it's off the ground, so the vortex base is near the tropopause and extends all the way up into the mesosphere. So why do we care? I mean, this vortex, I mean, uh, what applications does it have in our lives? So back in the 80s when we discovered the ozone hole, uh, realized that the polar vortex down in the Antarctic plays a critical role in confining the uh, air and that results in a very cold Antarctic vortex, uh, air confined to high latitudes and the chemicals that uh, are trapped inside with the clouds. It creates a sort of laboratory that uh, is conducive to ozone loss. And if you look at a movie of total ozone, uh, column ozone, the low ozone, um, marked by the blue regions on any given day is defined by where the vortex is on that day. So the edge, how it wobbles around and stretches, that's all based on where the edge of the vortex is. So the vortex is intimately connected with the area of the ozone hole, whether or not it's growing or shrinking, um, and the recovery of the ozone hole. Right now at LASP, I'm um, working with Cora Randall to study space weather effects on the atmosphere, um, big solar storms, flares, coronal mass ejections, and the particles and energy that gets uh, careened toward the, toward the Earth through the solar wind and trapped into the magnetic field. This may be more related to sort of the altitude regions where you all do research. Um, so the radiation belts get populated with particles and the magnetic tail and so forth, and the polar vortex is sitting right there where the magnetic field lines converge. And if you blow up that little box and look inside, um, you know, the polar vortex is ideally situated right underneath where all of this energy and, and particle, solar particles uh, precipitate into the atmosphere. They generate chemicals that then interact with the ozone, which affects temperature, winds, and waves. And it really speaks to the whole Sun-Earth system, wh whereby the vortex acts to couple uh, solar and uh, atmospheric effects. So this is a really fun project that um, the vortex is critical, is playing a critical role. Another schematic of the same process, where we've got the sun in the distance and uh, sort of energetic particles flowing in from the upper atmosphere and the ionosphere and down into the thermosphere. And here you've got the vortex uh, sitting over the pole. It tends to uh, broaden with altitude based on the equatorward tilt of the wintertime jets. And what is most important is it, it, it acts to confine air to high latitudes. So 
it, just like the Antarctic with the ozone hole, will act to confine uh, NOx and HOx generated by the, the electrons and protons, and chemical reactions with ozone then occur in the vortex, and, and descent in the vortex uh, brings this stuff down into the stratosphere. Yeah, it's that in a low pressure system at the surface, you have a bottom, a rigid bottom boundary, and you have warm air in the warm front in the warm conveyor belt that's rising, and that's uh, contributing to the low pressure. And this is a low pressure system that's aloft, that's there because of the cold air below, and it doesn't have a rigid lower boundary. Air can flow out of it out through the bottom of it. Um, so there are different mechanisms that maintain the low and different um, circulations, both in the vertical and horizontal, uh, associated with it. It's a really good question, and I need to think more about how to answer it to. Um, well, I think the key is that there's no lower bound. Right. Um, Right. 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 So what I do, um, what I do to contribute to this uh, research effort is I take meteorological data sets from, um, say, reanalyses of MERA or, or the Japanese reanalysis or the ECMWF, and I apply a, a numerical algorithm to say where the vortex is on any given day at any altitude, latitude, or longitude. Are you inside or outside? What's the spatial extent? What's the vertical extent? What's going on? Uh, where is the polar vortex? So. Uh, instead of just having a, an idealized schematic of that you know, broadening cylinder, I can say, oh no, the vortex is actually this shape on this day, and this is the region over which you can expect the air to be confined. Finally, uh, the vortex does play a role in surface weather, and there's a really nice, uh, oops, there's a really nice YouTube video by John Holdren, Obama's old um, science advisor, talking about the um, Arctic amp amplification and how the polar latitudes are warming at a faster rate than the equatorial latitudes. And so, you know, here's the, the typical situation. And then if you've got a warmer stratosphere because sea ice is melting and you've got more radiation in, up into the middle atmosphere, that's going to act to weaken the jet stream, which is going to give you larger amplitude planetary waves. Larger amplitude waves are going to result in a, in a polar vortex that is uh, more disturbed, more displaced, and weaker. And it's sort of counterintuitive, but uh, with a warming climate, what we expect to see is more cold air outbreaks, so that cold air can't be confined up at the polar latitudes anymore. It sort of uh, sloshes down more often. And we might experience uh, in Colorado, say, or on the East Coast, uh, colder conditions with warming climate. So, uh, but to link uh, event by event is uh, still a little bit beyond our, our reach. Uh, and that's sort of what I'm interested in pursuing, is how we can say on a day-to-day -day basis what we expect to see next week and possibly come up with some kind of metric that could say um, the vortex is doing this, uh, the probability of uh, surface weather of this type is more likely. Okay, so uh, moving on to planetary waves and the jet stream, uh, really important mechanism by which the atmosphere is coupled in the vertical. So this is a, a map from that Earth Null School site where you can look at the wind speed, and here we've got the U.S., and the colors are the, the wind speed, and you see large undulations in the jet stream. This is in the upper troposphere where you've got a big ridge here, and the, the jet stream goes uh, d is deflected all the way up almost north-south, and then it dips severely uh, over 
the, the south and the east coast of the US into a trough, and you've probably got cold air below, uh, and you probably got warm air below the ridge. And these waves propagate not only from west to east, uh, throughout horizontally in the atmosphere, but also upward. And since the density of the atmosphere decreases with height, those wave, the waves amplify, and then they break and they deposit momentum into the atmosphere, and, and they change the background flow so that when the next wave goes up, it breaks at a lower and lower altitude. And in that way, you can get sort of this weekly to monthly uh, upper atmosphere influence on surface weather. Those waves do go up into the stratosphere and they wreak havoc. They disturb the polar vortex. They push it off the pole and, and they can split it in two. And, and this is a polar stereographic map uh, where the blue denotes sort of where the vortex is. And it, it's an animation, if I can get it running here, to show you that it's not just sitting there stationary. It's moving around. So this is January of 2008, where we've got the vortex. And my algorithm has drawn a line around it. So the edge can be this, this black line. And this anticyclone is a slightly more, um, well, a lot more um, complicated algorithm. But that's denoted by the white line. And what's going to happen is the anticyclone is going to push the vortex off the pole. Since it's at more sunlit latitudes, it's going to warm up. It's going to weaken. And these sort of events happen all the time every winter in the northern hemisphere because we've got land sea contrasts and a lot of mountains we've got a lot of waves that propagate up into the middle atmosphere and the the arctic vortex is highly variable it's always on the move it's um, got a lot of variability associated with it i mean it, during these events over the course of a week you can have temperature fluctuations on the order of 100 degrees and it's like hiking from Siberia to the, to the Sahara in a week and you know just ginormous temperature fluctuations and uh, so the atmosphere is coupled through through the planetary waves but I want to uh, move away from these uh, 2d maps and stack them up like a stack of plates and look at multiple altitudes at once and uh, I just always wanted to see what the what the vertical tilt was of the vortex um, and what was going on at lower or up, upper altitudes uh, compared to the map that I was looking at. So here is the map that I just showed with the the polar vortex is you know in in blue and this corresponds to about this altitude if you slice across. So what I've done is I've defined the vortex at multiple altitudes and I've just stacked them up and plotted them all at once. So here's your polar stereographic at the bottom and you're looking at the North Pole from say Singapore over, somewhere over in East Asia and the vortex is colored by temperature so the temperature at the tropopause from the tropopause up to the stratopause increases with height through the stratosphere. The flow around each one of these circles is counterclockwise because it's a low pressure system and then the black regions are the anticyclones so you can see at this altitude this is the lowest altitude where this anticyclone exists and it extends all the way upward below it's not there the vortex is rarely shaped like a perfect cylinder it's often um, you know shaped like a lima bean or a peanut um, or some non non-circular shape uh, because of all the waves that are always around. So that was my very lengthy um, intro. Why is the vortex here? What's going on now? And why do we care? And so what I wanted to do is move away from these meteorological data sets that I'm used to working on in the stratosphere and look at the polar vortex in Wacom X. And you know, I just applied my algorithm to higher and higher and higher altitudes, and I didn't know what to expect. I mean, I thought, well, maybe the vortex just continues on up into outer space. Um, you know, it's got to taper off at some place, but where? And so that was my, my um, goal at the outset was, uh, the question was, does the winter polar vortex span the mesopause? And um, if so, how often and where in both hemispheres? And uh, what does that mean in terms of transport of trace species down into the stratosphere and the impacts on the ozone budget? So to start off, I took uh, SD Wacom, that's specified dynamics. It's running the model with observed uh, meteorological conditions at the bottom boundary so that we can then compare day to day to satellite observations or meteorological analyses and see 
just kind of evaluate how accurate or how what the level of agreement is between the model and the observations. And so I took this 2009 time period where there was this huge stratospheric warming event. Um, it was a vortex split. So by the end of January in 2009, the vortex completely unzippered and was two distinct lobes. And I wondered what it looked like at the very top in the model. I applied my algorithm, which I'm not going to go into, but briefly it involves integrating a quantity that is the relative contribution of strain versus rotation in the flow. So this map shows you this quantity called Q, and it's negative where there's rotation that dominates the flow. And I integrate that quantity uh, within these stream function contours. And the outermost area where it's still rotation dominated is where I define the vortex edge. So it's a wind-based algorithm, which may or may not be valid up in the upper mesosphere, lower thermosphere. But I apply it nonetheless, and I'll show you the results that I get. All the way up from 30 to 130 kilometers. So this is an overview of the conditions that are going on at the time. Maybe a lot of you are familiar with uh, the strat warming, where um, we've got altitude time plots for the month of January and part of February in 2009. And um, on the top, we've got SABER. So the SABER instrument, it measures temperature. Um, and from that, we can uh, calculate uh, balanced winds. So we've got temperature on the left from SABER and um, winds on the right. This is all up at um, the polar latitudes. So you've got the stratopause that um, descends during this stratospheric warming event. At the same time, you've got mesospheric cooling and due to the vertical motions that are going on, you've got descent in the stratosphere and local ascent in the mesosphere at even higher altitudes than Saber can see. You have thermospheric warming. And you've got winds that blow from west to east, typically around the vortex. But during these strat warming events, you, the wind completely reverses and blows in the opposite direction. And you get winds that blow from east to west. Um, you know, above the jet, uh, it's not exactly clear what's going on, but during the strat warming, everything reverses. And you've got, instead of uh, positive winds going west to east, you've got negative values going uh, east to west, and then they reverse all the way up to the mesopause. And then the, the jet reforms afterward. So this is what the model shows in terms of temperature and zonal wind. Um, it looks reasonable. We're definitely looking at the same atmosphere. And it gave me confidence that you know, the results that I'm going to get by applying uh, my vortex algorithm should be um, you know, reasonable and worth pursuing. So you know, people are used to looking at the vortex through this altitude range. What is going on through this altitude range above the stratopause and in the mesosphere, lower thermosphere? So here it is. Uh, we've got temperature and winds like before. And then here we've got a plot. It is not the most intuitive way to look at it. But we've got altitude and time in the polar regions, where black denotes whether or not I identified the a cyclone or the polar vortex. And red denotes whether or not I identify an anticyclone. And so you know, at the beginning of January, you've got red above black. So you've got the vortex that uh, extends throughout the stratosphere as expected. The blue is the zero wind line. So you've got black where you've got westerly winds. And then as soon as you hit that zero wind line and you've got easterlies above, it turns into an anticyclone. And so this is contrary to what I was expecting. Uh, you in The vortex does not extend all the way up to outer space. It, in fact, in the model, tapers off and then reverses direction. And during the stratospheric warming event, everything flip-flops. The, uh, in the stratosphere, it goes from vortex to anticyclone. It goes from black to red. And above that, it goes from red to black before it switches back to its nominal conditions. So uh, that was surprising. And I wanted to dig deeper and um, sort of diagnose the, the latitude extent, the um, the 3D structure, and then look at the mechanisms that are driving the phenomenon, uh, the anticyclone in particular, in the MLT. So we've got the vortex, 
and we've got the winter anticyclone at high altitudes. And this is true for different flavors of Wacom. I've looked at um, both free running and specified dynamics versions of Wacom with uh, forced by Mara meteorological analysis, the uh, Navy's no gaps model, um, Wacom Dart. They all have uh, the westerlies turning to easterlies in the MLT, and those easterlies are associated with an anticyclone. So it might just be a new way of um, thinking about the circulation in the MLT. Maybe it's been known all along and, and I'm just presenting it in a, in a different way. So if you look at three different altitudes during that same time period, these are now latitude time. So in the lower stratosphere and then up in the um, upper mesosphere and lower thermosphere, you can see um, temperature on the left, winds on the right, and it's through January and part of February. So you've got a cold polar vortex. The vortex is denoted by the black stippled regions with anticyclones traveling around the periphery in mid-latitudes. During the warming, that's, it all changes. You get warming and uh, white stippled regions replacing where the vortex was. This is all to be expected and nothing surprising. Up at 100 kilometers, this is altitude where you're now slicing through that anticyclone. And it's warm on the, uh, at the highest latitudes because that's where you've got the descent at the top of the residual circulation. And during the strat warming, you've got mesospheric cooling, uh, followed by uh, even stronger warming in the reformation of the stratopause at high altitudes. And then in the lower, lower thermosphere, the, the anticyclone persists and you get thermospheric warming, uh, at least during this event. The winds shift from westerly, westerly to easterly, but at higher altitudes, they go from easterly to westerly, and they do that all the way up into the lower thermosphere. So in both the previous plot with altitude time and in these plots that are latitude time, I've done a lot of averaging. You need to average around a latitude circle or in the entire polar cap in order to accommodate having time as your x-axis. And it results in I mean, great first cut, you know, what's going on overall. But in terms of what things look like on a day-to-day -day or hourly basis, uh, I really feel the need to look at all the dimensions at once. So longitude is this underrepresented dimension that we should all embrace, or local time, I guess, for those of you in the lower thermosphere. And that's what I do here. Um, I don't do any averaging of any kind. I take the full 3D output at each time step and animate it using my, um, the movies where you can look at all the vertical altitudes um, at the same time. So the vortex is in color, the anticyclones are in black, you're looking at the North Pole from East Asia with altitude as the vertical axis, and this is January of 2009. And so what you see is the polar vortex moving around, the anticyclones moving around, each frame is an hour, and there's not a whole lot of diurnal variability, but if you look at higher altitudes, this is what it looks like. It, the vortex closes off, it ends abruptly around 85 kilometers, and you get a black anticyclone. So you've got flow around the vortex in the stratosphere and mesosphere, and then it stops and flows in the opposite direction. And this anticyclone up here, it moves around a lot from hour to hour. There's definitely diurnal variability. There are tidal effects. Um, it's a more transient phenomenon that needs to be characterized um, if it is even appropriate to look at it in this way. The profile here is the zonal average zonal wind uh, at 60 north. So westerlies go to zero, the zero wind line, and go to easterlies uh, up in the, lower, in the lower thermosphere. I guess, E regions. So I stopped the movie before all hell broke loose and the vortex split, but we'll show just a couple, because things get really complicated and I haven't figured them out yet, but I've got a couple frames from uh, subsequent strat warmings that illustrate the vertical continuity of these circulation systems. So on the left, we've got a strat warming in 2010. On the right, we've got a strat warming that's a split variety in 2013, and in both cases, this anticyclonic circulation extends all the way from the lower stratosphere continuously up across the mesopause. 
And I'm open to your thoughts about that. I mean, I can't find any um, documentation of that in the literature. And I don't. This is, I am pretty sure this is a Wacom X run. Using the, the early yeah, it early doesn't early. have the most recent um, fixes that right. Hanley has been working on. It'd be really good to get um, some of those, some of that output and just run my code and see how things look differently. Sure. Yeah. Um, I did a couple sort of preliminary experience with exper experiments with uh, Astrid where we looked at you know, joule, the contribution of joule heating. Um, and what is it? The run that had a big solar storm associated with a lot of joule heating had this uh, really strong, robust anticyclone extending across the mesopause versus the, the run that had no joule heating had the vortex extending on upward. So big differences. Right. Right. So neutral ion interactions. Yeah. You know, for uh, I always th thought that I was lucky to work in the stratosphere because I didn't have to deal with the phase change of water and or a lot of turbulence uh, associated with flow around buildings. Um, but now I feel like I've gone too high. And, and things have now gotten complicated again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to come, come back down across, and stratosphere mesosphere is sort of where I, I should live. OK, so um, just a few more slides. I wanted to look at you know, sort of the lo local time de dependence of this, this um, anticyclonic feature up here that I've been marking. So here we've got latitude, altitude. And we've got temperature on the top and zonal wind on the bottom, where the stippled black regions denote where there's a cyclone or a pol polar vortex. And the white is where you've got the anticyclone. And I have stripped out all the local times um, you know, and made an um, animation that shows the evolution over the course of an average day. So this is a January average. I've taken all the days, all the zero Zs at whatever longitude they occur, average those together, all the one Zs, and so forth. And if you look at the evolution, you know, things don't change much in the stratosphere over the course of the day, but above about 80 kilometers, and the fluctuations are huge. I mean, these, the winds, you know, change sign and um, just really large variability above the, in the upper mesosphere and, and lower thermosphere. I can show this, um, you know, over the course of the day, that's what's going on in an average sense. And so um, another way to look at um, the evolution of, of the anticyclone and the, and the vortex in local time, so now we've got um, altitude and local time is the x-axis. And this is, again, that average January condition where the vortex is black and the anticyclone is the white. And in the background, you've got con uh, color contours of the zonal, zonal wind on the top and meridional wind on the bottom. And the, there's not a whole lot of diurnal variability. There's very little diurnal variability in the vortex. Um, but once you get above you know, about 100, 110 kilometers, you've got the meridional wind going from you know, equatorward to poleward over the course of the day. And, and the zonal winds going from you know, directed toward the west to toward the east over the course of the day. And this is going to result in fluctuations in, um, in that anticyclone at really high altitudes. So the winds are doing this. They're, they're absolutely rotating around the globe. 
If you uh, look at slightly lower latitudes, so that was at, at near the pole, if this is down um, along the periphery of that anticyclone, you see that the, um, it's at lowest latitudes in dawn and dusk. And so you do see these uh, diurnal variations that um, in, in the evolution, the daily evolution of this circulation. So in summary, you know, where it is in latitude and height, uh, 60 to the pole, 90 to 130 kilometers associated with really strong winds, greater than 50 meters per second. So robust feature in terms of the wind field and there's large diurnal variations. I'm still exploring the, the mechanisms that force it from gravity wave drag to joule heating to ion neutral interactions. And, and showing what, what happens during strat warms from climatological conditions. Um, I think I'm gonna end there since if I launch into the last part of my talk, I'm gonna go way over time and it's just a totally different area. So, uh, you know, what I'm most interested in is the confinement of air to high latitudes and, and how air is transported down into the stratosphere and what is the role of this anticyclone in the MLT in vertical transport and coupling the atmosphere. And maybe I'll come back next year and show some results that are more mature and have some more answers instead of presenting all questions. But thank you so much for paying attention and, and attending today. Absolutely the opposite. So instead of a cyclone, you have an anticyclone in the summer. And above that, you have a cyclone again. So it's the complete opposite of what's going on in the winter. In the winter, you have a cyclone topped by an anticyclone. And in the summer, you have an anticyclone topped by a cyclone. And the vertical circulation is opposite as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on. Uh, weaker temperature gradient because the Arctic is warming faster, whether or not it's due to ice or not, and that results in a weaker jet with more waves and a weaker vortex that spills the cold air down more, in a nutshell. Yeah, uh, I just, yeah, I, I think that I'm talking about the same thing. I don't think I'm bringing up any new phenomenon. I just, do, I can't find anybody looking at the winds in like a map. It's all zonal mean or, um, you know, average local time in latitude and height. And then there's a lot of disagreement between where the zero wind line is and how strong the winds are if you look at hardy versus windy versus tidy or saber winds or uh, radar winds at point locations. It's all, you know, maybe it's variable and it, we really need to, you know, get more rockets and more of the CIRA and the, all these climatologies. But um, it seems like there's, a, there's ambiguity in exactly what's going on up there. Um, and then the model, I, it seems like the model has easterlies that are too strong overall. So, and it's probably tied to the gravity waves for sure, they play a role in establishing that wind uh, reversal, like you said. And then there's also other stuff that's going on, like the heating, the ions, and you know, help me figure this out. So when you say that, In 
both hemispheres in the winter at cyclone. It's, it because spins in the opposite direction. Left, right. So it spins in the other way, but it's still a low pressure system, which is a cyclone. Right, right. Cyclone in winter for both hemispheres. No cyclone. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, the ozone that I showed here was in the Antarctic. So I went from Antarctic to Ar Arctic without really s telling you. That wasn't nice, well, but. But the key, a key point there is that the Antarctic and Arctic vortices uh, uh, are, are morphologically dissimilar during, the, during their respective winters and probably during their summers as well. Right. Um, and so, which is why you have a, more of an ozone hole. Southern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. Right. So, so you're, you have a, a, a great tool set to connect those differences in morphology, hemispherical differences in morphology, up through the mesosphere and, and possibly to the lower bounds of the thermosphere. Right. I think that's a, a, a really compelling point. Yes. That is the intent. Thanks. Uh, so usually the last part of weapon X results, the 3D vortex structure. Can you compare with your previous study using geo geospatial? I guess it's not geospatial. Where there's overlap, it agrees well. And then Wacom extends on and I don't have anything to compare it to. Could you use this up to the 50 pounds? 75. When it goes into geo, what kind of, you know, from observation point, what are you looking at? How do you derive from observation to get this? Um, up in the, did I look at what? What kind of observation gives you indication of this? Is it pressure you're measuring or wind? Um, so, Geos or Mara assimilates MLS and Saber and um, Radiosan's up into the lower stratosphere, but Saber and um, MLS and some Tyros radiances up to about the stratopause. So it looks like it's measuring sort of indicating pressure? Temperature. Temperature. Yeah, and then from that you can infer uh, balanced winds, gradient winds, um, or geostrophic winds. No, for that you'd have to go to like a no gaps alpha or Wacom Dart is just about as sophisticated as we have for a model that assimilates uh, mesospheric I observations. I, I, right. I, I don't think that the, uh, I don't think that this, I don't know that much about it, but my impression was that the standard reanalysis product from here and so forth uh, can be pushed up to the stratopause Right. Because as you point out, once you get out of the stratosphere, it's not constrained. It, 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 yep. It's not Kansas anymore. Yep. Exactly. You're in Mars. I mean, well. So then that's exactly right, because that's where the lower boundary would be. <laughs> right. 
I mean, it's fun. It's it's more uh, just a model, seeing what it does when it's free running, just like a Wacom that's nudged and looking at it in the mesosphere or thermosphere. But it has a lot more uh, physics than the reanalyses do. Um, I take the basically the horizontal winds and the temperature, and I calculate some other parameters, and I apply some fairly sophisticated routines that we could talk about after if you want the details. I could even give you the the code if you're interested in demarking the vortex in any kind of output. Yeah. Well, maybe we should give you the output of the models on the <laughs> I, you know what? I need to run the code locally on whatever machine the output is. I can no longer transfer data. I've gotten to the point where, you're right, like I've hit my limit. I, computationally, I can't take these huge terabyte, you know, like it's, so I could do that. I could totally port my code and, or run it from my machine up in the cloud and access. No, it's all post-processing. Right, so you just need some history of that. Well, daily 3D or hourly 3D. If you're, if you're large. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but you could, um, <coughs> I, I mean, you, you could, you could run, maybe the solution is get it, getting some, some Cheyenne time so that you could just right. run it right off the blade. But yeah, porting my code to a computer where the data sits, <coughs> running it there, yeah, I mean, that I makes mean, sense. I mean, it's not yeah, yeah, but yeah. You're, you're, about to, you're about to submit a big proposal on a Munch IM. Right, okay. Yes. Yeah, I think that is a, a really rigorous test of a model, is a point location. And the data, NASA needs that data. Yeah. Basically, location has to be measured from the movement of the balloon and diffuse the winds. Yeah, it's a, it's a rigorous test in... Uh, for the model to be compared in that way. It's good, I think, to take a point location yeah. and be it a stationary or a balloon and, and look at what the model says at that place at that time. And it's, you know, you don't get your, the benefit of averaging and things being smooth, it's, it's rigorous. It's, it's a difficult task for the model to reproduce that level of detail. Right, like some of the model people would say, well, that's not what our models are for, you know, we're global climate models and blah, blah, you know, like it's hard for, you know, the models are great and they do, you know, a fantastic job, their whole atmosphere, but that one little spot to do a comparison at one place, one time is, it's asking a lot. I like doing it. <laughs> I like asking a lot of the model. <laughs> yeah. You know, I haven't really been keeping up. I've got this project that I'm doing in my personal life. <laughs> but um, there was a big strat warming in the end of January. So I wonder if that coincides with the movement of this hurricane. I don't, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I have to do some digging.
Yeah. I do remember the petition for Congress Bill created, and before I wrote the petition, there was a notice for the year. Do I remember that? Yeah. Um, I don't remember the Europe part, but I remember the vortex split of 12. Yeah. yeah? That's when everybody started talking about the polar vortex. That's what they used to think. I thought it was 14. Ah. Yeah, I think that um, studies that link uh, specific colder outbreaks to what's going on in the stratosphere, event by event, are on the forefront. I don't know that we are. We don't. I don't think we have that pinned down yet.